TV's changed a lot as a medium since the first broadcast way back in 1935. Recently, I've been thinking about how it's changed just over my lifetime. By all objective measures, it's better today than ever. With crystal clear pictures and a million streaming options, you can watch virtually anything, anytime, and in the palm of your hand. If it's so much better, then why does it feel so much less engaging to me? Why am I nostalgic for a time when TV was anything but convenient? To help me understand where this feeling is coming from, I decided to recreate the experience of watching over-the-air TV in the late 70s and early 80s. It's been a fun project, and I've learned a little bit about the power of nostalgia in the process. Today, I want to show you what I made, and we'll talk about how it works. This channel has a lot of younger viewers, so let's start with an educational video about how TV worked back then. It is led off to the transmitter in the form of electric current. The signals are broadcast as radio impulses into space. Context is important. I grew up in the Blue Ridge Mountains of Northeast Georgia in the late 70s and early 80s. This is before anything like cable satellites were available in the area. This was the backwoods. The mountains blocked the broadcast signal, and the extended distance from any major city meant that rabbit ears wouldn't work well enough. Instead, tall antennas were mounted outside of houses to pick up weak signals. Sometimes they had motors attached that would rotate the aerial antenna so it could pick up additional channels. We had one of those at my house, but we had to spin it by hand at my grandma's house. That was okay because grandma lived on top of Scaly Mountain, which meant she could get all three networks, plus PBS and Turner Broadcasting TBS, out of Atlanta. At my house, though, we lived in a hollow, so we only got Channel 4 from Greenville, South Carolina, clearly. The rest were very, very fuzzy, unless the clouds were just right so the signal could bounce off them. But TV was important to me. Some of my earliest memories started there, and it gave me a glimpse of how big and wonder-filled the world really is. While there were some gems, the truth is that most of the time there was nothing on a kid would want to watch. Each of the three networks in the U.S. had a lineup, and they played that lineup. There was no fast-forward, rewind, or skip. If a presidential address was happening, it was on all the networks, so if you wanted to watch TV, this is what you were going to watch. If you missed a show, there was no way to watch it until it came on again in rerun season, if it ever did. As for quality, the picture was always bad and the sound was often even worse. So here's where I set out to reconstruct the experience and see what I could learn from it. I decided to focus on the period from 1978 to 1986, or when I was 6 years old to 14 years old, since that's the period just before cable, satellite dishes, and VCRs started becoming more commonplace. It really changed the way we consume the media. I knew I could never make a convincing experience on a modern flat screen TV, so the first element in my retro TV simulation is this RCA color track from 1986 that I recently picked up for another project I'm working on. I was using it for retro gaming and something about the familiar feeling of the tube operation convinced me to do this project in the first place. For the first step, I needed software to simulate television stations. I built a Python-based backend that constructs a catalog based on movie files in a directory structure that's split up by network. It uses MoviePy to get information on the files and stores that in the catalog. Then, at the start of each week, it will build a weekly schedule based on a per-network configuration. It uses a couple of different methods to cut in commercials, network bumpers, and promos to provide a natural filling. Just for fun, I built a retro-looking UI using Textual that lets you browse each network's current schedule. Playback uses IPC sockets to control the MPV movie player. For hardware, I tried a couple of different options. The Orange Pi Zero doesn't support hardware-accelerated video playback. The Raspberry Pi Zero did a great job on playback, but it took too long to start and switch video streams. It wouldn't be convincing. So, I went with a larger but more powerful option of a Raspberry Pi 5. Now that I had software and hardware that would support multiple channels, how would I switch channels? I thought about trying to hack into the channel controls on the TV, but I didn't want to risk damaging it. 
Instead, I thought back to the rotating aerial antenna days. We had a box on top of our TV, and when you wanted to turn the antenna so you could pick up a new channel, you rotated the knob on the box, and that would signal the motor on the antenna to turn. I found this unit and thought it would work great. It's from before the era, probably the early 60s, but old equipment would definitely be authentic to the time and place I'm trying to recreate. At first, I thought I would just tap into the output of the screw terminal signals and pick up channel changes. What I realized, though, is that these aren't really signal cables. They send the actual power to turn the motor. After a careless screwdriver touch sent out a shower of sparks, I decided this old box was not safe to operate at 120 volts, so I cut the cord, looking for a different way to tap into the rotating dial. It wasn't hard when I found this thing on the side. It wasn't hooked into anything, which made me think my unit might be missing some critical components anyway. I used some JB weld and copper wire to put in a post. Every time the two contacts touch, I can read the signal just like a button press. I wanted to keep the channel change mechanism separate from the video playback machine, so I added a Raspberry Pico into the design to pick out rotation signals and then connect the Pi and Pico together using UART serial lines. The original unit had a nice warm glow, so I added a NeoPixel LED strip so I could recapture that look. I also added some cool effects just for fun. Now I needed a place to house the little computers. There wouldn't be room in the antenna rotator box. After thinking about what might look at place on an 80s TV set, I came up with this cigar box. It was super easy to mount the little computers in there, and there's plenty of room inside for these and more. I'm using SD cards, so it's easy to update the lineup. I added some buttons that would provide manual control for stopping or rebooting the video playback machine. Now that I have all the pieces, it's time to put them together and test our simulation and see what it was like to watch TV in the late 70s and early 80s. We'll see what we can learn from it. This wall. We shall win after all. The world will be ours. <laughs> no, about them. I've seen them on Gallifrey in the constellation of Casterberus. Ha ha! Police woman. Charlie's Angel. Overall, it simulates a TV situation of the day pretty well. When you change between channels, the shows appear to continue playing serial in real time, just like over-the-air broadcasts. If you tune in on Saturday morning, you'll find cartoons. On Saturday night, you'll find old SNL. There are soap operas during the day, and at 6 and 11 is the news, and Johnny Carson comes on after the news. As we get closer to the holiday season, it'll mix in holiday specials, and PBS has long pledge drive breaks. If you don't like what's on, there's literally nothing you can do about it. It plays what it plays. I've spent hours watching it so far. What's the verdict? Was TV better back then, or am I just suffering from nostalgia? I think it's more complicated than that. Here are some thoughts I've had from the experience. TV shows were not inherently better back then. There were a lot of shows back then, poorly filmed with thin plots built on weaker premises. TV shows weren't inherently worse back then. There were a lot of great shows that stood up the test of time. At any time, most shows want to appeal to most people, and since there are fewer choices with live TV, that leaves a pretty good chance that there's nothing of interest on at any particular time. If good programming is rare, that gives you something to look forward to and something to reflect on. It also makes it more likely to be a shared experience with other people, which gives you something to talk about if you all saw the same thing on TV the night before. Streaming lets you choose from all shows, current and past, so you numerically have more good shows to choose from. If good programming isn't rare, we risk moving from one good show to another without the time to savor the experience. Even then, the number of choices leaves you feeling that there's probably something better if you keep looking, so satisfaction's a difficult target. It also reduces the chances of having a shared experience with random people. So to answer the question, was TV better back then? No, it wasn't. It was just a different technology in a different time. TV's always been a commercial endeavor. It was never a pure art form with a golden era of purity. Just like any commercial technology at any time, it comes with benefits, risks, drawbacks, and limitations. What matters is how we consume it and the role we let it play in our lives, because that's the only part we actually control. It's up to us how we use it and what we take from it. 
I've had a good time building this thing and I really like the outcome. It seems to generate nostalgia in Gen Xers like me and even my Gen Z kids think it's neat. I doubt I'll watch it too often, but we plan to keep it out and running over the holidays to maximize on the nostalgia. Thanks for watching. If you want to build your own retro TV experience, I'll post a link to the GitHub and Hackster.io projects. They have everything you'll need except the content. You'll need to build your own content library anyway, so you can make it from whatever time and place pulls your nostalgia. Collecting and formatting era authentic content took the most time and effort by far. I used old VHS tapes, DVDs, digital purchases, and other legal means to build a convincing catalog of personal content for my own viewing pleasure. Like and subscribe and leave any questions you have in the comments. Thanks.